Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. And they really want you to stay on those biologics for X number of months to make sure that they're working and stuff. So I was really trying a biologic once a year, basically, and moving through, ticking them off one by one. Oh my gosh, I've changed so many biologics. I think I've counted seven different ones in the last nine years, six or seven different ones. And then I finally hit on one in the last year and a half, too, that has kept me steady. Finding the right treatment for psoriatic arthritis is certainly a winding road filled with trial and error, hesitations, and moments of hope. If you or someone you love lives with psoriatic arthritis, this experience might sound all too familiar. Have you tried multiple treatments? Were you ever hesitant to switch due to worry over safety concerns, side effects, or fear of switching from a pill to an injection? We've asked these questions to members of our psoriatic arthritis patient community to learn more about their treatment journey and how they've worked with their healthcare provider to navigate the hope, fear, and challenges that come with finding the right treatment for you. A treatment that brings relief and improves quality of life. My name is Ashley Krivolavik, and I am in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am 39. I've been living with psoriatic arthritis for about nine years now, and I just graduated with a certificate, a master's certificate in population health. I am working on the submission, a patient perspective submission for American College of Rheumatology, and I am taking the summer off. I guess for right now (laughs) and we'll see what comes next. Hi, I'm Angela DeGrassi and I'm the host of the Psoriatic Arthritis Club, a podcast from Creaky Joints and the Global Healthy Living Foundation. We're back for a second season to further explore the ups and downs of managing and treating PSA, which for the uninitiated is an abbreviation for psoriatic arthritis. We're going to talk about things like what's working and what isn't. We'll be sharing insights from patients and leading rheumatologists. So let's get going. Hi, Ashley. It's always great to talk to you. Welcome to the show. Hi, Angela. So exciting to be a part of this. I am so excited to do this. I am always happy to talk to you, Ashley, and I want to share with our listeners a little bit more about you. So in addition to making a submission for the American College of Rheumatology Patient Perspective Program, just completing a master's program, and job hunting, there is so much more about you and so much more work that you've done. You have been featured in WebMD, Women'sHealth.com, Reader's Digest, just to name a few. You also sit on the Global Healthy Living Foundation's Patient Governor Group, which I am also a part of as well. And you co-chair the Central Region Advocacy Board for the National Psoriasis Foundation. This year, the National Psoriasis Foundation named you Advocate of the Year. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. It was such a surprise. I honestly did not know it was coming until it was already done. <laughs> I didn't know I was even in the running. So wow, it was a nice surprise. <laughs> well, congratulations. And that's a great accomplishment. You've also worked with the Arthritis Foundation and with the Arthritis National Research Foundation. You also recently wrote an op-ed in support of step therapy reform in Oklahoma and spoke with local lawmakers about copay accumulator reform. There's no doubt that you are a very busy patient advocate. Yes, I try to stay busy. It is passion work is what it is. It's a labor of love. (laughs) We can tell. It does keep me quite busy but I am so proud to be doing it. So Ashley, I know you as an advocate, but I also hear that you are a voracious reader and love to read not only medical studies and research that could help you manage your condition, but also enjoying literary classics like Great Expectations. This makes me wonder if someone were to write a book chronicling your psoriatic arthritis journey, what title would best capture the essence of of your experience. 
probably great expectations is a great title. I guess life is like a box of chocolate. Good one. Oh, um, you just never know what you're going to get day to day with this. So that's a good one. You never know what you're going to get. So what was that like for you? Can you tell us what were those symptoms that you experienced that first prompted you to take action and talk to your doctor about what was going on? Yeah, when you look back, probably there was a lot of lead up to the diagnosis, but you just don't realize it's always like weird little quirky things. And so I do remember though, I went to bed one night and then the very next day I woke up and I was swollen. I was sore. I couldn't move very well. Like it was just a lot, a lot of like the classic symptoms of psoriatic arthritis. And I have family history of autoimmune. So I kind of in the back of my head had the idea that I probably should be seeing a rheumatologist at this point. So it took a while to get into the rheumatologist. I think it was about a month, maybe two. And I got diagnosed shortly after. We ran a lot of tests and they had called it inflammatory arthritis because they weren't sure yet. So they started me on like Plaquenil and and then we finally figured out it was psoriatic. So it just felt very like sudden. It was one day I was fine. I went to bed and then the next day I woke up and had all of these symptoms and they just have not abated. You described that well. And it's a story we've heard from other people too. You start to have the symptoms and then there's a long wait to see a rheumatologist and get that first appointment. And then you finally receive your diagnosis. Let's let a medical professional weigh in. I want to introduce you to another guest that we have with us today. Dr. Ruderman is the Associate Chief of Clinical Affairs in the Division of Rheumatology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Ruderman will be our guest in our third episode and will provide his insight as a medical professional. Dr. Ruderman, what do you think of Ashley's story? And what have other patients told you about the onset of their PSA? And are there any classic symptoms that people might experience that would convince them that something's really wrong and they should seek medical attention? You know, that story is not all that unusual, but it isn't always that rapid, but it can be. And I talk to a lot of people who, as you said, actually, things are going on and you're not so sure, but then all of a sudden there's a big change. And that's what prompts you to seek help and get help. Unfortunately, it can take a long time to see a rheumatologist. There aren't enough of us, and that is a challenge. But one of the things that struck me in your story was the idea that you woke up in the morning and you just couldn't do very much. And that's one of the symptoms that I think should make people push their primary doctor or, or their dermatologist if they're seeing a dermatologist for psoriasis to say, I need to see a rheumatologist. Because for us, that kind of symptom, that kind of stiffness in the morning is one of the key hallmarks marks of inflammatory arthritis as opposed to osteoarthritis, which is just wear and tear that you may get as you get older. And in your situation, it was not clear that it was psoriatic arthritis up front, but in many ways, just knowing that it's inflammatory is going to take us down a path to get you to the right approach and to the right therapy. And so those kind of symptoms, whether it's sudden or not, and sometimes it's sudden and sometimes it isn't, but you know, I tell people, if it takes you an hour or two or three to get going in the morning, that's not right. And that should prompt you to talk to your doctor to help get you to see a rheumatologist to figure out what's going on and what we can do about it. Thanks for that insight. It's evident that the journey to a diagnosis and effective treatment for inflammatory arthritis can be challenging, especially considering the scarcity of rheumatologists. Ashley, did you have both joint and skin symptoms at the beginning? So when I was 12, I was diagnosed with psoriasis and it was mainly on my scalp. So I knew that I had psoriasis, but I don't remember them ever talking about the potential for the psoriatic arthritis at that time. And I just, I thought, okay, well, I've kind of got this under control. Like I had the idea that I would be living with psoriasis for the rest of my life, but it was kind of like in a remission state. I didn't have and still do not have a lot of skin activity. So when I woke up with all the joint stuff, it was like I had a lot of people in my family that had rheumatoid or like lupus. So those were my first suspects. 
And then as we kind of went along, (laughs) I remember sitting in the doctor's office and they go down a long list of like family and medical history with you. And they were like psoriasis. And I was like, I don't know. And then I was like, wait, yeah, actually I do have psoriasis. It had not been kind of like a part of my every day, so I didn't really think about it anymore. Like it had been in remission, and I never really had a ton of skin activity. So when they listed that, and I was like, oh, wait, yes, I actually do have psoriasis, they started doing the antibiotic testing, and then that's when we found out it was that. What was it like starting treatment for your very first time? It was hard. It was really hard. I have stomach issues, so oral medications is really what they want you to start with. And because one, they're cheaper, and two, that's what most patients want to take. It's just a pill. And I was very much on board with that. (laughs) But I had so many stomach issues that I finally was just like, I don't think I can do this. The rheumatologist and I, we made the collective decision to get on a medication that would be injectable and started with a DMARD, injectable DMARD, and from there just kind of gradually added things, biologics, to the mix as well. And they've always been injectables or infusions for me because of said digestive issues. Yeah. So getting started on those meds must have been a really challenging time. For those of us that don't know, can you tell us what a DMARD is? So it is a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. When you started your first DMARD and biologic, did you have any hesitancy due to safety concerns? Oh my gosh, yes. When they give you (laughs) like the printout sheet of all of the stuff that you can do, you can't do, or you can't take this with this, (laughs) there's interactions. It was so scary. I really didn't know. I hesitated a lot before I really got on anything that was especially biologics. I fought really hard not to be on them for as long as I possibly could just because I was the list of things, (laughs) the interaction is so long. And I was just very worried too about my future with, because I was looking at with these medications for somebody that's younger, you're looking at decades on these medications. And so do you want to start that right now? You know, at such a young age, um, there were just a lot of variables to it. And what ultimately got me to doing it was one, I was not functional. I wasn't able to do anything. My symptoms were not being managed well. And I was tired all the time. The fatigue was just overwhelming. So I wasn't like a productive member of society at that point. And I saw what non-treatment can do to joints and deformities because my maternal grandfather had a rheumatoid and walked with a cane my entire life. And so I saw the deformities and how if you don't do treatment, this could be a future for you. So it was very much like, okay, I don't want to go that route either. (laughs) So seeing some advanced disease activity in someone else kind of gave you the nudge to get started on that treatment. Absolutely. He didn't have those options. Biologics were not around when he was doing, you know, going through. And I don't even know if they were using a lot of DMARDs. I just saw what it was doing, what it could do. And it was not a future I wanted to see myself go down. It was quite, (laughs) that was more scary to me at the end of the day than in the laundry list of things that could potentially go wrong with being on a biologic or a DMARD. Right. And has the same treatment worked for you over the years or has there ever been a time where you changed treatments? Oh my gosh, I've changed so many biologics. I can imagine. Tell us about what that was like. What made you come to that decision where you said, okay, this isn't working. Time to try something new. And did you have those conversations with your rheumatologist? Uh, My rheumatologist, I almost feel very sorry for them because 
I'm very much like, okay, I want to go and look at symptoms. So I track symptoms with Arthritis Power. I use that app. I am always happy to hear people say that. That's awesome, Ashley. It truly is. I mean, not because this is Global Healthy Living, but it was really, truly just something that was useful to me. And so I would track symptoms and I would say, okay, I got infusion this day. And for three days afterwards, I was fatigued and literally slept like 16 hours out of the day or something, you know. And I really did want to quantify all of the symptoms. So I would go in with a laundry list of things for my rheumatologist to go over. And they're just wanting like a quick 10, 15 minute, like, how are you feeling? No, I came in like armed (laughs) with so much information. And what really drive me is if the combination of my symptoms were not being managed and labs were not going down or even near normal, it just didn't make sense to keep staying on a very expensive medication that's obviously not working. And so my goal always was to be one of those patients where I could just go in for 10, 15 minutes and be like, yeah, everything's good. Let's keep up the momentum. So what really drove me was the combination of symptoms in my labs. And I went through with biologics, I think I've counted seven different ones in the last nine years, six or seven different ones. And then I finally hit on one in the last year and a half, two that has kept me steady. So that's a lot of big changes in just a few years. Yeah. And they really want you to stay on those biologics for X number of months to make sure that they're working and stuff. So I was really trying a biologic once a year, basically, and moving through, (laughs) just ticking them off one by one. And has there ever been a time when you felt complacent in your treatment or a time where you were not feeling your best, but perhaps not quite ready to change your treatment because the thought of changing might have felt a little too daunting? So like every time that I've had to do it, yes. (laughs) Because along with changing medication, you don't know how you're going to react to it. And so that's daunting. And then the prior authorizations, I mean, (laughs) that among itself is a full-time job, just trying to get those taken care of. The back and forth between your insurance company and the doctor's office and the pharmacy But I knew that once I hit on one, I would stay on it for as long as possible. So a good example of this is recently I went from this particular medication that I have been on for about, at this point it was about a year, year and a half, was infused. And it just became very daunting to have to go to the infusion center every month. And so I decided maybe we should try the injectable version. And so even though it's the same medication, you still have to go through the prior authorization and then you have to go through the specialty pharmacy and the doctor's office. And it can be like almost a two month process before you're approved. So I started that journey in January and I finally got approved and started with injectables in March. And it was weird because I really wanted to make sure that like I would be getting full benefit from injectables that I was getting from infusion. But this change was more because of a desire to like for my lifestyle, not wanting to go into the doctor's office, you know, every month for infusion. So it was really just about my comfortability, not that it didn't work or it wasn't working. And so I almost felt guilty about that because I was like, it's fine as it is. It's just harder for me and it's harder for the scheduler because rheumatologists are so busy. It was difficult to keep at a four-week mark. So Anyway, I made the decision and I mean, I've been on it for three-ish months now and so far so good. So let's just keep our fingers crossed on that. Well, we're happy to hear that. My fingers are crossed for you. Let's talk about flares. Flares are a hallmark of rheumatic disease. Do you experience flares and what are they like? Yes, flares are always going to be a part of my life. Even though I think probably, I think everybody's 
like definition of remission is different. I would probably say that I don't have like everyday activity with my joint anymore and my labs are like getting close to being average, which is new for me. So when I do have flares, it almost like triggers like, is this the one? Is this the one that's going to pull me out of remission? It's very scary. Can you tell when you're about to have a flare? Are there any warning signs or symptoms that you know, oh, I know what's coming? Yeah, I get a really dull ache in my fingers, particularly. And then I start really wanting to sleep. Fatigue is like a huge thing for me. So those would be my two things. And also, I don't know if anybody else has this, but I get this weird like sensation in my knees, almost like a numbing sensation. And when I get that, then my fingers start in and then the fatigue kind of sets in. And so it really does start with the weird knee numbness type thing in my knees. And that's really my first indicator that something's coming. But right now, the only time that I really have issues is if it's raining, you know, weather type stuff, or if, of course, stress will do. (laughs) Stress does it every time. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Stress is a big one. Can you tell us if you have any hacks or tips that you can share with people that might help with flares or dealing with your symptoms? Yeah. So what I have to remember, and this is the biggest hurdle, like it's the easiest thing, but it's also the hardest thing is to remember that it shall pass and that you need to absolutely take care of yourself, truly listen to your body. So if your body is like, you've hit the wall, you need to go take a nap, that's exactly what I need to do. And I communicate that to people around me. And the other thing that has truly helped me get through flares has been my support network. I have so many people in the same community that we just rally around each other. Somebody is having a flare and we're like, okay, what can we do? Can we send you food? Can we send you some groceries or, you know, whatever else you need? Do you want to just text or do you want to call? So community has been huge for me. And these aren't like, yeah, put some biofreeze on your joint and call it a day. (laughs) But they truly do help to have that kind of like outlet. And a lot of times now for me, it is just a mental hurdle. Like there's nothing really at this point that I can do in terms I'm doing all of the medication type stuff. And, you know, a doctor would tell you or a rheumatologist would be like, here, take some steroids for your flare. And if you don't want to go that route, it's really just like trying to mentally get through the pain and the like swelling and all of the other things. I'm so happy to hear you have that support group. I really am. It's great to know that you have people that know what you're going through. How did you connect with those people that are in your support system? Oh, my gosh. So through trial and error, but the first was through Twitter. I was on Twitter. I was very active for a very long time there. And I met so many amazing people. And I met them really through doing creaky chats and supporting each other through posts and stuff like that. And then meeting people too, at just different advocacy avenues. And I'm the co-chair for another committee. And it's people that are locally in my region. So it's nice to have people that are local to me as well. And that's where we really connect with people. It was really through social media. Seems so weird because you always hear the negatives about social media, but I now have people that I am talking to regularly every single day, and I'm so proud of them. That's really fantastic. And we are going to wrap up this episode by asking you one last question. What's a secret that you would only tell members of the Psoriatic Arthritis Club or those who may become part of the club? Oh, it's a club you don't want to be a part of if you can help it. But since you're already a member, (laughs) you know, welcome. I'm truly sorry. (laughs) that you're going through this, but we will get through it together. We're very strong together and you can't do it alone. And I want everyone to feel like they're included and that they have a support and 
truly that has been a huge transition for me as I've gone through the many, many stages of psoriatic arthritis and treatments. The community is there, so welcome and let's do this. Those are really comforting words. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us today, Ashley. You really are an expert, and I'm really happy I got the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much, Angela, and Global Healthy Living Foundation for all of the opportunities that you have afforded me. I am truly blessed to work with so many amazing people, and I'm so excited to be a part of this podcast. So thank you. We feel the same way. Thanks, Ashley. I always appreciate talking to you. And to our listeners, that's it for the Psoriatic Arthritis Club. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope that Ashley's story will resonate and help you discover inspiration on your disease journey. And if you haven't already, make sure to check out our first season where we share more incredible stories that inspired and touched the hearts of our community. You can find all episodes on our platform. This podcast was made possible with support from AbbVie. For more information and stories from other PSA patients like you, subscribe to the Psoriatic Arthritis Club or visit psoriaticarthritisclub.org. You can also visit creakyjoints.org for the latest information and news about living better with PSA. If you like what you've heard, be sure to rate our podcast, write a positive review, and spread the word by sharing with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.